Deuteronomy chapter 16, verse 1. Observe the month of Abib and keep the Passover to the Lord your God. For in the month of Abib, the Lord your God brought you out of Egypt by night. And you shall offer the Passover sacrifice to the Lord your God from the flock or the herd and at the place that the Lord will choose to make his name dwell there. You shall eat no leavened bread with it. Seven days you shall eat it with unleavened bread, the bread of affliction. For you came out of the land of Egypt in haste, that all the days of your life you may remember the day when you came out of the land of Egypt. No leaven shall be seen with you in all your territory for seven days, nor, any, nor shall any of the flesh that you sacrifice on the evening of the first day remain all night until morning. You may not offer the Passover sacrifice within any of your towns that the Lord your God is giving you, but at the place that the Lord, of your, Lord your God will choose to make his name dwell in it. There you shall offer the Passover sacrifice in the evening at sunset at the time you came out of Egypt, and you shall cook it and eat it at the place that the Lord your God will choose. And in the morning you shall turn and go to your tents. For six days you shall eat unleavened bread, and on the seventh day there shall be a solemn assembly to the Lord your God. You shall do no work on it. You shall count seven weeks. Begin to count the seven weeks from the time the sickle is first put to the standing grain. Then you shall keep the feast of weeks to the Lord your God with the tribute of a freewill offering from your hand, which you shall give as the Lord your God blesses you. And you shall rejoice before the Lord your God, you and your son and your daughter, your male servant and your female servant, the Levite who is within your towns, the sojourner, the fatherless, and the widow who are among you, at the place that the Lord your God will choose to make his name dwell there. You shall remember that you were a slave in Egypt, and you shall be careful to observe these statutes. You shall keep the feast of booths seven days, when you have gathered in the produce from your threshing floor and your winepress. You shall rejoice in your feast, you and your son and your daughter, your male servant and your female servant, the Levite, the sojourner, the fatherless, and the widow who are within your towns. For seven days you shall keep the feast to the Lord your God at the place that the Lord will choose, because the Lord your God will bless you in all your produce and in all the work of your hands, so that you will be altogether joyful. Three times a year all your males shall appear before the Lord your God at the place that he will choose, at the Feast of Unleavened Bread, the Feast of Weeks, and the Feast of Booths. They shall not appear before the Lord empty-handed. Every man shall give as he is able, according to the blessing of the Lord your God that he has given you. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for your word, and we thank you for the ways in which you guided and, and, and taught the Israelites uh, in, in this season. Uh, as we read in the book of Deuteronomy, Lord, uh, even though it was thousands of years ago, God, uh, there's so much that is revealed to us about who you are, uh, so much that shows your heart for us, and, and Lord, also a reminder of who we are, Lord. So God, we pray that your spirit would make sense of your scriptures to us, God. We cannot understand your truth without you, Lord. It is your word. So God, we pray that we will hear your voice and not our own. Lord, we pray that you would speak to us and that we would be shaped by your truth. And Lord, that we would hunger and thirst for your wisdom and your presence in our lives. We thank you for this time. Help us to submit and surrender to you in worship. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So, uh, if you know me, this isn't a big secret, but uh, I'm 29 years old. My birthday is next month. And um, so I'm turning 30 and when I tell people or when they're reminded that I'm turning 30, I get this response that I don't quite understand. People are saying, oh, wow, you're turning 30. That's a, that's a big one. And uh, I don't know. I, I wonder, is, is, is my 30th birthday somehow more important or more meaningful than my 29th birthday or the 31st birthday? I mean, I understand that it's cool because we like things in multiples of 10, and you know something that ends in zero just kind of looks cooler than something that ends in a, in a nine or a one. But other than that, other than it being just a round multiple of 10, what meaning does a 30th birthday have? And that kind of begs the bigger question, is there any kind of specific meaning to certain years or 
certain times of a year or certain times of the day. I mean, isn't time all the same? Isn't, you know, the, the, the earth just spinning on its axis and it's, you know, orbiting the sun? And, you know, isn't, isn't time just meaningful just because we're putting meaning to it? Isn't, is there anything really objectively meaningful about any specific season or any specific year or time of day? And when you think about that, you think about these uh, special days that we like to celebrate, not only 30th birthdays, but, you know, in, in Latin culture, there's quinceañeras, where uh, women, I mean, girls become women. That's a celebration at 15 years old, right? The quinceañera. And in other cultures, we, like, for example, the Jewish culture, we see like bar mitzvahs or bat mitzvahs. In Korean culture, we like to celebrate 100 days of things, so... When a baby is born, they call it pegil, which literally means 100 days. They celebrate 100 days of life. And you know, obviously this has translated to uh, romantic relationships where couples celebrate 100 days of being together. And uh, another big family uh, celebration is, uh, is with our elders. We um, make a big deal out of an 80th birthday, right? An 80th birthday is more significant in terms of how we treat it than a 79th birthday or 81st birthday. So, I mean, that's enough evidence to show that as human beings, of course, not everyone feels this way, but there are special times in life. Not only special years, but there's special times of the, of the year. Um, we have seasons and we celebrate seasons in different ways. Um, we wear different clothes, not only because it's practical, but because I guess there's certain fashion trends per season. Why do we do these things? Well, I'm not saying all of those, uh, all these traditions about how we treat time are equally valuable. But what it does show us is that we look for meaning in time. We look for meaning in the year. We look for meaning in the expanse of our lives. It's not just that every day is exactly the same, even though sometimes we like to treat life that way. And we see here in today's passage that God is also the same way. Is that God gives special meaning to certain times of the year, especially when it uh, pertains to the Israelites in today's passage. We see that God gives three very specific tradi traditions for the Israelites to keep. And this wasn't the first time he instructed them in this. In fact, uh, if you look in Leviticus, there's more details about what these three festivals or feasts entail. Uh, but these were very important traditions that God wanted the Israelites to keep, especially as they were transitioning from being wanderers in the wilderness and going into the promised land finally. Keep in mind that that's the whole context of Deuteronomy. This whole book was written as Moses' final words from God to the people before they finally entered the promised land. And the central idea of today's text is that the traditions of God reveal who He is. Okay, The traditions of God, they have a common purpose and they have a common meaning of revealing who God is. They're not just arbitrary rituals that God commanded people to do so that he could see how well they obey them, but they were actually purposed for something deeper. They were purposed to reveal and to remind, to refresh the people in who God is and their relationship with him. So these traditions have extreme value and purpose. They did have extreme value, and they still have meaning for us today, even as Christians, even though we are not Israelites, there is still significance to these, and I'll get into detail of how that is the case uh, later on. But God, we need to, yeah, we need to keep in mind something important here, because as Christians, or just people who believe in God, we love to talk about God's timing, right? We say, like, in His time, or if God wants it to happen, it'll happen. And there's a sense in which we acknowledge the sovereignty and the kingship of God when it comes to things that are out of our control. And it's usually with things that are out of our control that we talk about His timing, God's timing, as if that's the only times that really belong to God. 
But God is not only in charge of his timing, but he's also in charge of our time. And I'm saying our with quotes because the point I'm trying to make is that our time is not really ours. Is that if we are serving the Lord, if we are children of God, if we are surrendered to him as our king, as our sovereign master, then our time is not really our own. And God cares about our time because with our time, we can honor God or dishonor God. God cares about what we do with our time, and he also cares about how we plan around our time. You cannot serve God without surrendering your time to him. You cannot serve God without surrendering your time to him. And that's something that's drawn out from this passage, is that God is assigning them these three festivals to keep throughout the year. And, and these three festivals cover a pretty wide expanse of time. Um, the Passover was seven days. The Feast of Weeks was 50 days. The Feast of Booths was another seven days. That's a lot of time. That's about two months out of your year that need to be devoted in a very specific manner to God. So God cares how we serve, serve Him with our time. And the sermon in a sentence for us is very simple. You might have even guessed it by now. Is that you must serve the Lord by surrendering your time to Him. You must serve the Lord by surrendering your time to Him. And that might seem obvious, but it's something that is actually more difficult and more overlooked than we might think. Sometimes we tend to think that serving God looks a certain way. and It shows up in certain actions. But it's not just the behaviors. It's not just what we do that matters. But it's when we do it and how we prioritize the timing of our service to God that makes a difference to Him. As we get into this, how to serve the Lord by surrendering our time to Him, and why these festivals matter to Christians today. Uh, let's first get a breakdown of what these festivals were really about. I'm just going to kind of skim through just portions of the passage and, and draw out some key points. So the Passover is probably the most important festival in the Jewish tradition because it is celebrating how the Jews got their identity as a nation. It celebrates Israel being liberated from slavery and becoming the holy people of God. It's a, it's a big deal. And keep in mind that the Passover is the climax of the ten plagues. That there were ten other there were nine other plagues that took place that led to the tenth plague, which in which God took the firstborn child of every household. He, he killed them, except those that had the blood of a lamb over the doorpost. And those houses were the ones that God passed over, meaning he spared them. And that's why it is called the Passover in the first place. In verses 16, uh, in verses, in verses 1 to 8, we see God reminding the Israelites to keep the Passover. And there's this very specific way they're supposed to keep it. There's a very specific kind of sacrifice they're supposed to give. Um, the manner in which they take that sacrifice and treat the sacrifice, there's a very specific prescription for that. But I also want you to note in verse 5 that God says, You may not offer the Passover sacrifice within any of your towns that the Lord your God is giving you, but at the place that your, the Lord your God will choose. So not only was the Passover supposed to be conducted in a specific way, but there was a specific location, and it was only one location in which it was appropriate. Now, at the time um, that Deuteronomy was written, the people were not yet in the Promised Land, and Jerusalem had not yet become the place where God established His name to dwell. The temple was not built yet. But you see God foreshadowing that in verse 5. He's saying, you don't get to just offer the Passover in the comfort of your own home. In fact, the Passover, you can only properly observe if you go to the place where my name will dwell, which was later revealed to be Jerusalem. So there's very, very specific things. The timing, the location, 
the manner and the, the attitude in which you were supposed to observe this tradition, the Passover was very specific. And what is revealed about God in the Passover? Well, like all of these feasts, there's a lot of things that we can learn and know about God and how he reveals himself. But primarily the Passover celebrates and remembers that God is the Savior. That God is the one who frees us from the bondage of slavery, of evil, of darkness. That God is the one that liberated the people of Israel. That it wasn't anything that they did, but it was literally God in his grace and mercy. He chose the Israelites for his purpose to make him his people. And what did he do? He freed them. He liberated them from the most powerful nation at the time, Egypt. Moving on to the next one uh, that's mentioned here in verses 9 to 12 is the Feast of Weeks. Now, unlike the Passover, it's hard to tell what the Feast of Weeks is about. Um, but the Feast of Weeks began uh, with the ceremony of first fruits. And the ceremony of first fruits actually had a bit of an overlap with the Passover. So the Passover ended with a Sabbath day. And the following day, on the first day of the week, was the ceremony of first fruits, where the harvest season began and the harvesting time uh, where people were to give the first of their harvest to the Lord, not only from the field, but from the flock. And from that point, they were to count seven weeks. So it was 49 days from that point. So it was a total of 50 days. And this is where the people remember the time in which immediately following the exodus from Egypt. If you remember the story, after the Israelites were freed from the land of Egypt, they, they, well, they went in the desert for 50 days. And then we, at the end of those 50 days, we have what is known as the Pentecost. Pentecost um, meaning 50. The Pentecost was when Moses received the law from God on Mount Sinai. And they, these are the weeks that are being celebrated. It's this 50-day period that ends in the Pentecost, um, also in Hebrew known as Shavuot. And these 50 days, they celebrate the giving of the law, but also the hope and promises of God given the feast, I mean, the ceremony of first fruits. Keep in mind that Israel was not able to to grow crops while they were wandering in the wilderness. This was a festival that was only able to be observed once they entered the promised land. So here we have God promising them that they will have first fruits to offer him. They will have crops to give him. And in a sense, it's, it's like giving tribute to God with the first, the best, the priority of what was earned. But also, as I mentioned, it's a celebration of God's law. So what does the ceremony of first fruits or the feast of weeks reveal to us about God? The ceremony of first fruits or the feast of weeks reveal that God is the king. Okay, the, of course, you could say that about almost anything in the Bible. But specifically here, we see God providing a law, a, a, a code, a standard in which civilization was supposed to happen, the Ten Commandments given to Moses, but also we see God providing the land, providing a nation for them, which is uh, the coming into the promised land is, is tied to this Feast of Weeks, which, uh, which the Israelites were able to have their own land and have crops produced from that land. This was the promise of God being fulfilled. And giving God the first fruit was like giving a tribute to a king, which was acknowledging that he deserves, he deserves credit and recognition for the blessings. So lastly, in today's passage, in verse 13 to 15, we see the Feast of Booths. Now, the Feast of Booths happened at a later time. They, there, it was not overlapping with uh, the ceremony of first fruits or the Feast of Weeks. It was a fall festival, and the Feast of Booths was observed for seven days. And it was meant to be practiced after the harvesting had already happened. So the Feast of Weeks is when the harvest is beginning, and the Feast of Booths happens when the harvest is ending. And keep in mind that this concept of harvest was one that was intricately, just essentially tied to the promised land because the Israelites did not have their own land uh, up until this point. So as the Feast of Booths happens, 
It's called the Feast of Booths, or also called the Feast of Tabernacles, because they were to build actually booths, like tents, in their towns, and that they were to celebrate and remember that they had lived a nomadic lifestyle, wandering in the wilderness until God brought them to the Promised Land. It was remembering where they came from, not just the point of slavery, but remembering the journey in which they had to labor and depend on the Lord to be their provider before bringing them into the promised land. And so they would literally build these tents after gathering all their harvest, and it was meant to be a celebration of acknowledging, hey, we used to live in these tents. We used to be a nomadic people without our own land, but now God has brought us into the promised land in which we can produce these kinds of harvests and enjoy them in the Lord. The Feast of Booths was meant to be a very festive time, specifically remembering God's providence in the wilderness. So that was the main thing that was revealed through the Feast of Booths, was that God is not only the Savior, He's not only the King, the authority, and the law, but God is the provider. That He promised the land, He promises a first fruit, and then He also promises an abundant harvest to those that are faithful. So God being the provider was shown in the wilderness, not only through his guidance, but through giving them manna from heaven. If you remember the stories, people had no food. God gave them manna from heaven to gather just off the ground every morning. And he also gave them water in the desert uh, through Moses. And when he he made water come out of a, a rock, so he gave bread and water. He gave the sustenance that people needed. And then at the end of the chapter, in verse 16 to 17, we have another given emphasis to observe these traditions. Three times a year, all your males shall appear before the Lord your God at the place that he will choose. So this was meant to happen in the place that God would place his name, which in the future was Jerusalem, in the near future, in the Old Testament. So all three of these feasts were meant to gather the Israelites from all across the promised land, which is like, the land of Canaan, the Middle East, the present-day Israel, from all the places that they were scattered to inherit the land, they were meant to gather three times a year in one place to celebrate these three festivals together. And they were to do so not empty-handed, but giving to God based on the blessing He had given them. So these three things that we see from the, the traditions, these specific three traditions Uh, of the feast, reveal that God is our Savior, that God is our King, and that God is our provider. But that's not it. Those were things that were easily and readily seen by the Israelites in the Old Testament. But ultimately, these feasts were pointed and purposed towards the revelation of God Himself in the flesh, Jesus Christ. These traditions that God put into place They were made to bring all the people of God together into one city three times a year. And these three times were very specific times in Jesus' ministry where Jesus revealed that not only these feasts, but all the traditions, all the laws, all the ways of the Old Testament, the Old Covenant, were being culminated and fulfilled in Himself. They all pointed to the revelation of God in Christ Jesus. Let's take the Passover, for example. When Jesus died, he died as the Passover lamb. The whole thing of the Passover, the deliverance from Egypt, the dying of the firstborn, being spared and freed from slavery, these were all things that really happened. And they had real meaning to the Israelites in the Old Testament, but they had a deeper meaning that was fulfilled in Christ at a later point. Jesus died as the Passover lamb by which we are saved. His death on the cross took place the day of the Passover, the day before the the Sabbath of of celebrating the Passover. He is the sacrifice that we must partake of for salvation. The whole system of the 
the feast of the of unleavened bread, the, the Passover, was all pointing to the death of Christ and the revelation of God freeing and forgiving us of our sins. Secondly, the ceremony of first fruits or the feast of weeks, Jesus was resurrected on the day of the ceremony of first fruits. And throughout the epistles, we see that the apostles refer to Christ as the first fruit or the firstborn from the dead into new life. So the timing of God was very, very specific. He instated these feasts thousands of years before Christ came, hundreds of years before Christ came. But when Christ came, Christ fulfilled the meaning because why? He was revealing in a fuller and complete way what these festivals were just foreshadowing towards. See, Jesus' resurrection is evidence that there is a harvest coming and that he is the first fruit of that harvest. There is a harvest of eternal life that is happening now and will be completed by God. That is what they were celebrating at the celebration of the first fruits. They celebrated the first fruit of the harvest with anticipation and hope that the rest of the harvest would be abundant and blessed. Furthermore, the celebration of Pentecost, the giving of the Ten Commandments to Moses at the end of the 50 days, Jesus stuck around for 50 days. And he, when he ascended to heaven, we need to remember what happened on Pentecost after Jesus' resurrection. Not, was, not only was the law given, like as Moses, but the, law, the Holy Spirit was poured out on mankind at Pentecost. Therefore, Jesus, we see him fulfilling the role of Savior in his death, his, his role as King in his resurrection. And then lastly, the Feast of Booths. We see Jesus fulfilling the role of the provider. He is the living water. He actually went and preached during the Feast of Booths in Jerusalem. When people had a longing to see the glory of God, they, want, they were remembering God providing manna, providing water from the rock. Jesus shows up and he says, I am the bread of life. I am the bread of heaven. It's not manna that's going to save you. That was all just foreshadowing my coming. And then he even says, I am the water of life. He says, I will give you living water. He is the sustenance we need. He is the provider. You see, all these feasts revealed, revealed who God was to the Israelites in the Old Testament, but they were also setting the stage for Jesus in his perfect timing and according to God's perfect purpose, reveal to these people who had been keeping these traditions, Jesus gave the full meaning of them as being God revealed in the flesh. Now, what does that mean for us Christians, you might be asking? And the question, do traditions matter, is the title of this message. Do traditions matter? Because we don't keep these traditions as, as Christians. I don't know if you notice. I don't know if your church does, but we don't build booths. We don't build tents in, in Jerusalem. We don't uh, celebrate the Passover the way it's described here. We don't, sell, we don't give an offering of first fruits. And that's because Jesus fulfilled what these traditions were pointing towards. But what is important to keep in mind is that Jesus didn't come to get rid of tradition. Jesus didn't come to get rid of tradition itself, but he came to fulfill the traditions that God had set in place. What does that mean? Sometimes, as Christians, we can over-spiritualize everything in a, in a way that, oh, well, this was fulfilled in Christ. Well, that was fulfilled in Christ. Well, we don't have to do that anymore because we're in the new covenant of Jesus Christ. That's why we don't celebrate the Passover. That's why we don't have to offer our first fruits. That's why we don't do the Feast of Booths. And these are all true. But what we shouldn't do is ignore tradition itself, especially and namely the traditions that are from God. You see, Jesus, when he came, in the New Testament, he was highly critical of the traditions of the religious rulers of the time. Why? In Mark chapter 7, we see him say, you abandon the commands of men, uh, commands of God for the traditions of men. 
What he's saying is that people had be, become so attached to traditions to the point where they became more important to them than actually obeying the traditions that God had given them. You see, God had a purpose for these traditions. And it was, it, it was because people obeyed the traditions of God that it was because they, that's why they came to Jerusalem these times of the year and they were able to witness God in the flesh. You see, God doesn't hate tradition. God gives us traditions to follow. But we must be careful to make sure we do not treat the traditions of man like they are the law of God. There's a, there's a move amongst the church, just at large, where we have kind of steered in some ways too much towards being anti-tradition, being anti-structure. And oftentimes when you go and talk to people on the streets about Jesus or, or just interact with non-believers you know, they'll say, oh, I don't have a problem with religion or spirituality, but it's organized religion that I don't like. It's the institution of the church that I don't like. And oftentimes what they're thinking about is all the rituals and the rules that are associated with being part of a religion. Not only Christianity, but other religions have special rituals and ceremonies and traditions that they are called to keep. But you see, It's not tradition and ritual itself that are the bad things. It's when tradition and ritual are in the wrong place of our hearts. There are certain things about traditions that we like and we don't like. And the thing is, whether or not you're conscious of it, whether or not you consider it a tradition, we all live by certain traditions, whether they're cultural traditions that have been passed down to us, whether they're family traditions that are just specific to our family, whether they're regional traditions of being a Californian or being a Bay Area resident or being part of a certain city, there are are traditions that we follow. However, we can get very nitpicky with God when it comes to traditions that are given in the scriptures that are given for us to follow. So to answer the simple question, do traditions matter? The simple answer is yes. But how traditions matter Uh, might be a little bit more of an intricate thing. You see, the biggest reason why it's hard for us and we're, we're not naturally inclined to obey the traditions of God are because we live in a culture and this culture has its own tradition. The American culture is all about autonomy. It's all about me, myself, and I. It's all about, I'm going to do what I want, and no one can say anything about it. It's all about, I'm going to go after my dreams, I'm going to chase after my goals, I'm going to make things happen according to my time. See, the hardest thing about traditions to keep, oftentimes, is time itself. And I mentioned earlier that as Christians, sometimes we can be very blind to the fact that We think and we call ourselves servants and children of God, but we haven't really surrendered our time to Him. I just want you to think about it this way. As I mentioned, the the three feasts that were described in the book of Deuteronomy today, they took up a, a span of time that was around two months of the year. Now that's not to mention some of the other traditions that were also part of the book of Leviticus. Keeping that in mind, What if God were to ask for two months out of the year of your time? In addition to the weekly routines, right? Because the Jews, they kept the Sabbath. You know, they would offer all, all the other sacrifices. They would observe all the other statutes. But these three festivals were two very specific months out of the year. And they were, you weren't supposed to compromise them with anything. Imagine if God were to show up to us, the, the American church today, and say, two months out of the year, you guys need to do this. And no, no buts, ands, or ifs. This is my command to you. You must observe these in, in my time, and you must observe them in my ways. 
even if it were God to tell us that, I think a lot of us would struggle with that and maybe even blatantly disobey. Why? Because our culture reinforces that our time belongs to us. But the scriptures make it very clear that all of our time, all of our possessions, all of who we are belong to God. Therefore, we must surrender our time to God as an act of service to Him. Because that's the relationship we have with Him. He is God. And we are His people. It's not the other way around. We are not God and God is not our servant. We are servants of the Lord as Christians. Therefore, we must surrender our time to Him. And there, there is a shift in uh, churches that are happening where casualness equals the greatest level of intimacy with God. Is that is this idea that the less structure you have in the way you worship God, that it's more genuine, that it's somehow more valuable. But if that's the case, why does God give such specific instructions for traditions in the Old Testament? And I'm going to get to it, but we also see certain traditions, new traditions starting in the New Testament, especially in the book of Acts. You know, one of these traditions is the worship of God on Sundays. And you may ask, like, what's the big deal about worshiping God on Sundays? Isn't Sunday just like any other day? It's my day off. It's the day I don't have to go to work. Why do I need to spend that day worshiping God? Or maybe it is the day that you work and you say, oh, maybe Sundays just aren't important. I can always worship another day. It doesn't matter to God. Of course, there's no command in the Bible that we have to worship on Sundays. Don't get me wrong. But it is wrong to think that when and how you worship doesn't matter to God. You see, God gave very specific times for how to worship. And throughout the beginning of the church, the tradition of the new covenant people of God were to worship on Sunday. Why? Because that was when Christ resurrected. He resurrected on the first day of the week. Therefore, we remember the resurrection of Christ every time we gather. See, it's not only our time that we need to give up, but it's the gathering, the remembrance, the occasion. These are all prescribed by God. Not only in the Old Testament, but it's prescribed for the church in the New Testament. So much of what is written in the epistles of the New Testament are how the church is supposed to gather what the church is supposed to do when they gather, establishing the identity and the tradition of this new community that we are in Christ. And we must be careful not to just make Christianity fit our schedule. We must be careful not to make our relationship with God all about what's convenient to us. We must remember that we serve God. And for him to be our king means that he is in charge of our time. Therefore, how we schedule our year, how we schedule our weeks, how we even schedule our day does matter. And I'm not going to go into the details. Um, I, I don't have time to go into the details of the New Testament and say, oh, this is what we need to do, this is what we don't need to do, this is a tradition that was given that we should follow, and this one is, isn't a tradition that we need to follow. Um, today's message isn't about that. Today's message is more about a, an attitude, a shift of perspective that we all need to be reminded of, that we must submit our time to God. Our time is not our own, the same way our money is not our own, our livelihood is not our own, our relationships are our, not our own. That's what it means to be in Christ. It means that Christ fills everything, is that He is the Lord and the King of your life. I want to read from you a uh, from an article that I found on the Gospel Coalition about a Christian leader who grew up in a very rigid church environment, then left the church, and then tried a more progressive flavor of Christianity. And these were his reflections. He said, I'd heard about the dangers of moralistic therapeutic deism. The default American religion where God simply wants you to live a decent life and not be sad and doesn't intrude on your life. I originally ran with progressive Christianity to counter that kind of shallow belief. But what I found was just more of the same, only with new definition. Wokeness was the new morality. 
Therapy was a new path to happiness. Cancel culture was the new church discipline. And like moralistic therapeutic deism, there was conveniently no personal God to place demands on your life in any meaningful way. In this progressive version of Christianity, Elizabeth Gilbert's trope is the only thing left where she says, God dwells within you as you. There's no way to distinguish between ourselves and God. In this paradigm, we are God. I'm not anti-woke or anti-therapy. Systemic injustice is real. And we need the conversations that wokeness has brought us. I was in therapy for almost two years while in college, and I can think it can benefit almost anyone. But these are not adequate replacements for the eternal love of the triune God. Mark Sayers describes the progressive vision of the world as the kingdom without a king. We all want God's blessings without submitting to his loving rule and reign. We want progress, but without his presence. I thought that was a very good illustration of what it can become when we make our relationship with Jesus all about us. Yes, Christianity is so simple. It has everything to do with your relationship with Jesus. But your relationship with Jesus, by definition, is built on the conviction and the confession that Jesus is Lord. Jesus isn't your Savior. He isn't just your servant that just came to, to, to make your life better. He is your Savior and Lord. He is your King. He is God in the flesh. He is the revelation and the fulfillment of all the old covenant and the full representation of God. If that is the case, and it is, then we ought to serve the Lord with our time. We ought, especially during this season in quarantine, I feel like all of our concept of time has changed. I, I know for me, I feel like the days are just blended together. Some days feel so long and drawn out. I'm so bored. I feel like I'm just looking for Sometimes I get really hungry for entertainment. Other days I feel so busy and rushed that time is so short. And it's easy, it's so easy to break a rhythm of discipline in honoring God with our time. But let's be, let's be sure, let's be clear. Let's remember who God is. God is King. He is our Savior. He is our provider. But He is our King. And he cares about our time. Time is a resource that God has given to us. That's, you know, we always talk about how no one knows how much time they have left on earth. We don't know. We don't know. We have no say in how we are born and how we enter into this life. And we almost have no say on how we exit this life outside of, you know, taking your own life. Time is not our own. Time belongs to God, and how we honor God has a lot to do with our time. So we must surrender and serve the Lord by surrendering our time to Him. Let's remember Christ. Look at His example. Jesus was God Himself in the flesh. He knew what these feasts were about, but He did not ignore them. He understood the purpose, the heart of God behind these feasts, and He fulfilled their meaning. In the same way, we ought to fulfill the time, we ought to fill the time that God has given us based on the purposes of His heart. This is why we need to know the Lord. This is why we need to seek the Lord and serve Him with all of our heart. Because the time we have on this place, on this earth, is short. What we do with it is not up to us, it's up to God. And when we listen to Him, when we fulfill His will, when we submit our time, not only our long-term goals, but what we do each day, each week, each year, when we surround ourselves with His Word and let His Word shape how we allocate our time, then we are honoring God. That's how we bring glory to Christ. And specifically in matters of the church, just look at these three feasts. There's specific time. There's a specific way they are to gather and there's a specific way, they, the specific things they are supposed to remember and celebrate. 
time, gathering, and remembering in celebration. These are what the church also do together, and God has prescribed what that is about. I'd like to just close with one example. If you ask any average person in America, what's the biggest uh, tradition of Christians? What's the biggest time of the year for Christians? Many will say Christmas. And what's interesting is not that Jesus coming to earth wasn't a big deal. I mean, it was a huge deal. But there, there is another time that we are actually called to remember and to celebrate. And interestingly, Jesus or the apostles, none of them tell us to remember and celebrate the birth of Jesus. But what we are called to remember and celebrate actually align with these three festivals that are, um, that, that are talked about in today's passage. The Passover pointing towards the death of Jesus. The Feast of Weeks, pointing, uh, the fr- Feast of Weeks and First Fruits, pointing towards the resurrection of Jesus and the, and the giving of the Holy Spirit. The Feast of Booths, in which we remember where we came from, how God has provided and guided us. These are the things that should be happening in the gatherings of the church. These are the things that should be taking priority in our calendar year. Good Friday and Easter. Just wanted to leave you with that example because we can also be guilty of Jesus' criticisms to make the traditions of men more valuable or a replacement for the commands of God. What has God commanded us to remember? What has God commanded us to celebrate? When has God commanded us to do it? And how are we supposed to do it in our gatherings? So let's surrender ourselves to God. Let's surrender to the traditions of God, not the traditions of man. And let's be wise and observe. Because when we obey the traditions of God, that's when we see God for who He truly is. It was those faithful Jews that kept the the traditions of the feasts that were able to experience the most pivotal moments in history in the life of Jesus Christ. In the same way, those that are faithful to God, when we obey the traditions of God, They are purposed to reveal who God is greater to us. So let's serve Him. Let's not miss that. Let's surrender our time to our Lord Jesus. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we pray that You will be with us in this difficult time. Lord, everything is changing for everyone. Lord, nothing is the same. How we use our time is so different. But Lord, in the midst of this, God, we thank You for this timely word. That reminds us that, God, you care how we structure our time. You care what commitments we have in our schedule. And, Lord, that your, our time is actually your time. Lord, we thank you for this reminder. And we thank you for building traditions in the past to point towards Christ. And, Lord, we thank you that in Christ we have new traditions that continue to point to the glory of Christ. So we pray that in our lives, in how we serve you, that we can honor you with our time. It's the greatest resource. It's the limited resource. We don't know how much we have, but whatever we do have, God, we pray that you will use it for your glory. Give us this heart of surrender, and Lord, we repent to you now for prioritizing ourselves, our comfort, our aversion from, you know, just our own appetites, Lord. And as a result, not really following in your words and your ways. But Lord, help us to remember, Lord, that you care about all these things. That the reason the Bible is so long is because you care not only about salvation and the results, but Lord, you care about the means. You care about the journey. You care about the process of getting there. So Lord, help us to process our time with you. Help us to process our traditions after the tradition of Christ. We thank you. And we love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.